the equinoxes and the solstices, they just sort of really lend themselves to pausing and taking stock of where we are and where we're going and how we're doing for reflecting and for visioning, but also for really paying attention to like what nature is revealing to us. We are here creating a new culture that sees the power in vulnerability that sees the intelligence and emotions, that sees symptoms of the body as being a really intelligent way that the body is speaking to us and inviting our awareness. Different cycles it is part of our birthright. It's part of the sort of universal law, if you like. There's a cyclical blueprint. Hello, welcome, and thank you for being here. I am delighted to share with you that my book, Intuition, Access Your Inner Wisdom, Trust Your Instincts, Find Your Path, was released in the US and Canada this week. I know it wasn't the biggest event in the States this week, but pretty exciting nonetheless. If you don't have a copy yet, please do get yours. It's available as a hardback, Kindle and Audible book. And everyone that buys a copy can go to www.amisha.co.uk forward slash intuition and sign up for a beautiful gift package I have put together for you there with meditations, workshops and more. This includes the book launch event that I held in December with stunning live musical performances and some words from my editor and some friends and a little bit more of the story behind the book. In today's conversation, we talk a little bit about the journey into the darker places, the descent where we travel into the underworld and we learn new skills and wisdom that we can bring up to the surface. Sometimes this happens through illness and sometimes it's more like a thick, sludgy mist in the air. I was speaking with one of the incredible guest faculty of the beautiful leadership immersion this morning as we were planning to do an Instagram live. I was telling her that I was still feeling exhausted and internal. She reminded me of something important, which I feel we can forget. When you are sensitive and attuned to energy, you process more than what is just your personal story and trauma. It's part of the gift. And over time, you learn boundaries and practices to support with this. She reminded me that there's a lot happening in the world right now and in the UK, which is heavy and scary. And that even in my rest, some deep collective processing work is happening. It's not always easy to separate and discern between the collective and the personal. We must not forget the interconnection. When you are willing to feel, you may have to process for those around you that cannot, partners, family members, for your community. I used to feel a specialness about this and then at other times a burden. Now it just is. It's not good or bad, just necessary and a part of my sacred activism. In a way, it's the same as how when you run a business, you need to do your accounts. It's like the more that you attune to energy, then the more that you attune to energy that is bigger and more universal than just your own. I share this today in case you're feeling heavy and needed to hear this, in case you're finding yourself in a moment where these lockdowns, where the restrictions are mounting on you, where you feel that even though you're all right, Others around you are not, and that somehow feels heavy. And so always inviting you to live with kindness and to really honor your own journey and the ways in which that might be part of the healing of this world. As for the presidency changes in the US, this is a big moment of turning for the world. For many, release. And with that, there is a letting go of what has been held inside for years. It's normal to feel a delayed trauma response after something is over. This presidency has been extraordinary, with many in the spiritual community sharing that Trump is the savior. Meanwhile, many Americans experiencing deeper poverty and discrimination and the dissolution of sacred grounds. What we know is that having a president of the US, which affects everybody in the world, 
that believes in climate breakdown and cares about race issues is going to make such a difference to what is possible in this beautiful future. A beautiful future needs beautiful leaders. And a leader may be a politician bringing into form a new kind of politics, a different way of relating to the system that we have. A beautiful leader may also be somebody that does not associate themselves with the word leader or the old paradigm of leadership, that doesn't necessarily feel comfortable with the word beautiful, but is committed to deep inner work to showing up in this world as fully and embodied and as beautiful as possible, that is committed to understanding more about themselves and from that living with a sense of dharma, of sacredness in the way in which they weave in this world. On Monday, we begin the beautiful leadership immersion. It's a powerful 13-week journey, which explores what it means to be a leader at this time, or really a human being connected to who you are and your vision. It's really a program that brings to life in your life the themes that we discuss on this podcast. There are seven of these core themes redefining leadership and worth, shadows, trauma, and liberation, sacred activism and decolonization, embodiment and biohacking, vision, intuition, and edge walking, creativity, cultural futurism, and flow consciousness, and collaboration and community. As well as our live calls and community happenings, there is a collection of guest faculty who have been on this podcast that share their beautiful leadership journeys within the immersion. Jill Williams, a business psychologist, shared of this journey, the beautiful leadership immersion is the best investment I have made in my personal development in some time. And Misha has curated an immersion that speaks directly to your soul ignites the light you have within yourself and that brings you great clarity about the role you are here to play in the world. Through her exceptional personal wisdom and insight and by offering a diverse range of world-class leaders to learn from, Amisha has helped me shift my perspective on myself, my community and the world and has given me the confidence to be bolder, braver and more intentional in my work and how I live my life. If you would like to join us, you still can. Enrollment will close on Sunday so that we have our whole group for the opening ceremony. There are four price points in our sliding scale and I offer work exchanges if needed. You can find out more about this if you go to our website, www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash courses. And for one more person that joins the immersion, there will be a possibility of doing this alongside presence mentoring, where you also get bi-weekly one-to-one sessions with me. In these sessions, we can go very deep into your subconscious patterning and really awaken the gifts and the beautiful qualities that you have dormant within. My guest today is Ruby May, who is an educator, activist, coach, and community leader cultivating a world in which cyclical awareness is integrated into the way we relate and create. With a background including a degree in psychology, working as a burlesque costume designer, intimacy coach and dominatrix, the themes of empowerment and who we are beyond our conditioning are a thread that weave between all her offerings. We first met at a community gathering about seven years ago and we are part of a community, a different community at this time. This conversation is beautifully tender and delicate as we explore the themes of cyclical living, deep rest and new archetypes. In this conversation that we have called living attuned to life cycles, those in female bodies are centered during this conversation by Ruby, yet it has something powerful for everyone no matter what gender you identify as. 
In particular, there is a part in this conversation where we explore the growing number of women that are single for whatever reason and are not parents to children and what this might mean in terms of our collective future and in terms of us understanding archetypal energies. Throughout this conversation, we contemplate the question, how can we initiate a culture rooted in the cycles of nature and life? I hope that you enjoy this and that it opens up more possibility with how you live your life and how you frame it, honoring the cycles within. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is the revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, We create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. Ruby, I am absolutely delighted to welcome you as our first guest of this 2021 onto The Future is Beautiful. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) (laughs) I was just feeling into what a treat it is to speak to you because I'm so curious about what it must be like having connected with so many people who have their little piece of the puzzle and then the beautiful sort of holistic view that you've been sort of weaving and cultivating over the last year. So I'm excited about this conversation. My pleasure. As we were just looking at each other in that moment I had sort of flashbacks to different moments in time that we've talked about doing this conversation it's been on the pipeline for a while (laughs) and so I just sort of saw all of those moments at once which was kind of what made me laugh (laughs) Mm. (laughs) yeah that we find our time you have written a beautiful manifesto we don't really have readings and such like on this show but it feels like with the the stickiness and the heaviness of this start to the year with many people being back in lockdowns with some extraordinary American politics (laughs) happening and so on and so on and so on that these words feel very powerful they really nudged me to feel, ah, you're the first guest for this year. I love to hear that. Thank you. Okay, so I wrote this as we were coming into this year, a cyclical manifesto for 2021. And it's written as we because it feels like I'm sharing this with the beautiful women that I'm surrounded by, in um, particularly in the Know Your Flow Collective. So we claim our right to thrive in this world and the need to create new systems and structures that honor the cyclical blueprint of life. We claim our right to live in dignity, attuned to the cyclical wisdom of our bodies. We commit to stop normalizing going against our bodies through pushing and numbing and the exhaustion and the burnout this creates. We commit to upholding and embodying the global shift that's called for, transforming how we see intelligence as including the body, intuition, and emotions, redefining strength to include softness, sensitivity, and compassion, valuing our birthright of being as much as doing, resting without guilt and remembering our birthright of play. We claim the need for dissent, 
the power and grace of surrender that allows us to meet life in fullness and depth rather than skim the surface. The gifts of darkness, reminding us of wholeness and the trust in death as a beginning, not just an ending. Beautiful and powerful words. Mm. There is so much around cycles and understanding ourselves as cyclical. Yeah, there are spirals within spirals that we can play in today. Some things that you shared when we spoke at the Style and Presence Summit, and I highly recommend all the women to go and get that collection and listen to that conversation amongst others. One of the things that you were sharing was around how the world in which we live in hasn't been designed to honor our cycles. And I feel like some of those examples would help all of our friends listening just open our lenses to the world that we live in. Sure, I can give a few examples. And also just to share that I'm still sifting through the fog (laughs) to really see clearly. And I think that's one of the things, right, that we're so used to living in, you know, this culture that it's a big blind spot to see how far removed it is from our more sort of natural ways of being. So things that we sort of take for granted the sort of nine to five work day, working five days a week and having weekends off. If you are a being with a menstrual cycle, that doesn't really work very well for our bodies. I think that the way testosterone cycles, because testosterone sort of has a circadian rhythm, that that, that sort of average work day is, is designed for a male bodied person. That's one thing that a lot of us take as a given no that's how human beings function but uh, it could look quite different and then beyond menstrual cycles you know the seasonal cycles we're so lost touch with what that could look like if we were more attuned to seasonal cycles you know winter is the time where our ancestors would have really slowed down and um, it would have been a time for enjoying the harvests of previous the previous cycle it would have been a difficult time you know making I think the, the months between January and April were called the famine months have you heard that before no yeah it was a dangerous time as well but everything would have like come into a more stillness and slowness and it would have been a time to sort of take stock and enjoy family and be more internal and sort of recalibrate for the next year, the world would be a much better place if we were to embrace those uh, seasonal rhythms as well. How has that process been of reclaiming the seasonal rhythms for yourself? Well, the cool thing about cycles is that they keep repeating themselves. So you keep getting more chances to like deepen. (laughs) So every year I feel like I'm in a, a deepening I always have the shape of a spiral in mind, you know, that you're sort of going around a a circle, but each step of the way is a sort of deepening and it gives you that sense of spiraling, which I just adore. I think it's so beautiful. So the last winter solstice, for example, I just had such a beautiful time of really consciously slowing down and uh, really having a juicy reflection on the last year. I really feel that it's so supportive to then have others around us who are have in similar intentions and was very blessed to have this community of around me of other people who were also on a similar mission of really harnessing the time of the winter solstice. And I think in particular for this year after like learning about what happened and what we can take from it and what the gifts are and the challenges and I think is it just feels even more important this year so for me the winter solstice is a a really important time to reflect and to come more into listening and stillness so yeah I I plan my schedule so that I do less 
I choose the nature festivals like the solstices and the equinoxes to kind of pause and take stock of where I am. Also to sort of zoom out and look into the future as well. There's sort of these like pivot points that it just feels really, yeah, just makes sense to zoom out and have a bigger look and to use them also, especially the winter solstice for visioning. And also use them for, yeah, connecting more with wherever in the world I am with the, the wisdom of what's happening. The particular points, the equinoxes and the solstices, they just sort of really lend themselves to pausing and taking stock of where we are and where we're going and how we're doing for reflecting and for visioning but also for really paying attention to like what nature is revealing to us and the the lessons in that so is is nature showing us the importance of coming into stillness is nature showing to us the gifts of coming more into sensual exploration and allowing ourselves to sort of be more extroverted and to connect with the outside world or is nature revealing to us the necessity to let things die to shed and so it's beautiful it just feels like every year there's the possibility to sort of go a little deeper into that listening and receiving that that wisdom and ways to sort of tangibly apply that to your experience yeah I find that so powerful and and also have a practice of connecting to those same markers in our calendar and and as well as with the moons and being with the phases of the moon I have found that this solstice I stopped working and then it's been particularly hard to start (laughs) again Mm. it's interesting because I for for many years have been going to India in January and normally I take a group and go on a pilgrimage and I'm very much used to sort of starting the year I normally skip the cultural way of doing Christmas in the UK and the the eating and the watching TV and all of that kind of thing (laughs) and then I'm, I'm normally actually in deep prayer and perhaps somewhere warm and in a different cycle that's still quieter but it's not it's not winter but it's also not tv and eating too much and some of these kind of things that are are what a lot of people experience during the holidays and and this year I have been with family in the UK I have watched a lot of Disney movies and and then I found like actually that sort of coming out of that resting its own process and for me it ended up being sort of tied into like an inner death and rebirth cycle where I actually feel like I'm emerging renewed in a complete way that something in me that I was holding and carrying has has died and and then sort of taking that time to be reformed and to come back out and I was asked on last week's show, we did a Q&A. One of the questions that wasn't in the final episode was this question around rest and slowing down. And then how do you navigate those transitions of, say, when you've rested and you've really slowed down and then life is asking you to step up a gear or five because of your job or because of your family commitments or whatever it is and so you have to change gears and how do you do that in a way that honors that journey which isn't like the equivalent of drinking three espressos Mm -hmm. or something you know like I'm curious what your experience is around that Yeah, it's such a good topic. And I feel like I'm in this very privileged, quite unique position because I get to 
hear from so many women because I'm part of a collective that I've been sort of midwifing over the past few years of women who are really committed to this practice of living cyclically. And it gives me this fascinating, like you get the overview of all these people coming in to chat to you about the more beautiful world uh, and future. I get these different perspectives on living cyclically. And one of the things that I've noticed is there seems to be quite a collective tendency to be quite polarized with action, rest. You know, it, they, they're kind of extremes. We're either pushing ourselves quite hard or we're kind of like watching TV and really, yeah, kind of recuperating so that we can then go into action mode again. And there is, I think, also the way that our lives are designed and it requires that we jump back and forth really fast. And I think it's really tragic because then there's all these, I'm going to sort of meander before I answer your question properly, but I, I just want to share because I think it's really important to say that that's so tragic because there's so many different ways of being and engaging with ourselves in the world, like play, you know, play is not like goal-directed action and it's not rest, it's sort of somewhere in the middle and like, oh my goodness, how many of us have like lost the ability to be playful? creativity, resting that is not necessarily passive, active resting. Yeah, these are all things that I feel like we've sort of a little bit out of touch with and it's a shame because they make life rich and because they're kind of needed in order to feel like balanced and good within our skin. One of the things that I've really been sort of exploring and within myself is with how much kindness I relate to when there's these tensions between, well, my will or life is dictating that this needs to happen now, but my body is actually wanting something else. So the default, which I think maybe many people can relate to, is that we judge ourselves. Oh, come on, you know, you shouldn't be feeling tired. You know, let's just get on with things. Quite the inner tyrant that can live within us that's ever ready to like judge and say that we're not doing it well enough or it, you know, we shouldn't be feeling tired, shouldn't be feeling like it's difficult. And then just to learn the art of being really sweet to ourselves and compassionate, and that that's considered sort of just that permission to struggle or to feel a bit jolted leaping into action, just that permission somehow makes it easier then as well because the resistance somehow makes us feel even more blocked I find and the whole thing is harder yeah absolutely and people often ask me how do you do so many things or where do you get your energy from and it's like well because a lot of what I do is in that space of creative inspiration it doesn't ever feel like work and then that's so that's something that you don't need to rest from. And actually over the holidays, I started to watch a series of something to rest in that, in that kind of modern way. <laughs> and then, you know, I got into the binging as people do, as we do. And then this show had five series. So after like one and a half, I was already like, this is boring now. <laughs> and I need to, I need to rest in a different way. <laughs> because this is getting tiring what my system now needs is to be re-inspired <laughs> yeah. through action but it, it's like not through necessarily like productive action but like through action that just sort of reinvigorates my soul and what did you find that felt right for you did you find something yeah I mean this is where it's slightly dodgy for me because that is actually my work and so then when I started to work again, <laughs> I felt there. that inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Again. Yeah. I don't know if that's dodgy ground or not, but I actually feel like it's a massive blessing when work and play are the same thing. Also, I've been reading a novel that is inspiring. I mean, I could, can't say it's not completely connected to making a future co-creating a beautiful future <laughs> <laughs> but, you know it's definitely restful but sometimes it's so good to like do things that just we're not achieving anything we're not being productive in any way and I think that that little voice 
that's just so needing to prove our worth through achieving and being productive it's so sneaky like I'll catch myself like resting but then okay let's rest properly so that I can then work more and be productive and have something to show for myself or like we try and be creative and then it's not about the journey of being creative it's about like the finished end product and that it looks nice and you know that sneaky voice that just always needs to have something to show for ourselves but just wanting to respond to something you said about Netflix Oh, did you say Netflix? I don't know if you said Netflix. I, I, you mentioned, said watching I mentioned no brands. <laughs> <laughs> I endorsed no platforms. But the cultural phenomenon, what is it doing to us watching so many series? What is it doing to us? And like one thing I noticed with myself is that, you know, what, what does resting mean? There is an aspect of resting that I feel like involves integration it's like when we create spaciousness and we can then sort of, it's like a kind of digesting, you know, we, we need to digest our food, but we need to digest our experiences as well. If we don't, we end up feeling overstimulated and overwhelmed, or we just don't have the space to take in any more new information, or we're not really learning things properly because we're not sort of metabolizing the experience. And I've really noticed with myself that if I'm having intense experiences and then to come down, I watch Netflix, not a good idea <laughs> because I just end up, those that intensity then, you know, accumulates, you know, it might feel nice to sort of zone out, but we really need to create, I feel like we need to create time to digest and yeah watching Netflix doesn't cut it yeah absolutely when I'm in my my sort of more normal rhythm and I haven't been in my normal rhythm because of situation and um, circumstances with my family that most of our friends listening kind of know about and so I've been out of like my own kind of habitat and rhythm I've been living in a house with a TV, having not had a TV for 10 years. So even just taking some of that in when I go in to like get tea or like do that kind of thing, it's just like a whole other experience. When I'm in my own rhythm, a lot of my rest is really like doing nothing, lying down, looking at the ceiling and just being really still and or just having some music on and just like lying down. I really enjoy that. I've just started playing the piano again. That's like my way of rest, like active resting. And oh my goodness, it's so good. Because I totally got caught up in the workaholism, even though when your work is so purposeful like yours is and mine is. But I can still get caught up. I think so many of us can in overly doing it and not taking time to do things that aren't necessarily yeah, achieving something. Yeah, I mean it's tricky. I can I can pinpoint moments of time where it's definitely been about achieving something. And then I can pinpoint other moments in time where it's just about being smart to make sure that there's like enough that it's sort of not stressful because when you're also needing to work out how all bills are going to be paid and that kind of thing, there's also a sense of yeah, the the showing up that's required to make it possible to do something that's very unconventional. I have quite a healthy relationship with that. I feel at the moment, my favorite way of active resting in a way that's not, not productive at all is um, playing with watercolors. It's not of that. It's never ev of anything. It's just colors and, and they don't get put up anywhere. <laughs> 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 the book just gets closed <laughs> and, and reopened. Mm. But yeah, I think it's so important. It makes me so sad thinking back to when we went to school and how creativity was like reserved for like art lessons and you were graded at the end of the day or the term or whatever. And how it's so important. It's such a part of somehow what being a human is all about. And it doesn't necessarily have to be sort of creativity in terms of like watercolors or art or something, but when I'm creative, it feels like it, nourish, it really deeply nourishes an aspect of my being. And when I look out into the world, it just feels like, oh, we need more of that. Yeah. And, and I feel like we are so naturally creative in the way that we problem solve and see opportunities and 
the many things that we might do in a day, even just deciding what to eat and and how that's going to be put together. But yeah, a lot of people do get stuck in that trap of creativity being about producing beautiful art. And so for me, it was very powerful to produce art, if you want to call it that. But it, to me, it's not. It's just like playing with colours and it's but, not. Or, or just not thinking of ourselves as being creative. Oh, you know, I was told that I'm not creative in school and, you know, that's for other people. And it's like, as you say, there's something inherently creative about being a human, especially when it comes to like problem solving and thinking outside the box, which is what we need to be doing, right? To evolve and, and create more beauty. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They totally geek out on that on this topic of cycles as well because if you think of a cycle as being yeah a blueprint for for creativity as well whether it's a menstrual cycle or life death cycle of a plant or you know you can just see how necessary all these different phases are for creativity and each is just as necessary there's not one phase that's more important so the sense that like creativity emerges life emerges from darkness or yin or emptiness yeah I love that I can totally geek out on that (laughs) how do you experience that in your own life like not necessarily in terms of creativity but in terms of I guess the descent and darkness and living in a way that embraces that Mm, that's such a good topic yeah and and so many different ways so let's see what comes which is also a way of inviting dissent right now (laughs) (laughs) yeah what comes is um when I notice that I'm feeling brittle or like overly strung my body is inviting descent and so for me that means instead of like output and forward motion and sort of doing I come more into listening slowing down feeling being receptive if I feel like I'm blocked and I'm coming into like pushing doing something I'll do the opposite I'll come into letting go listening walking away reapproaching later and I will use my menstrual cycle often as a way to help me with that so there are times where I really feel like I need to like push it feels good to push and then there are times where it feels very clear that my awareness is being brought more internally my body wants to slow down and wants to perhaps release Um, perhaps there's tears that want to come or there's with that slowing down and becoming more internal it's like you start coming into contact with things that want to be processed or integrated or looked at which when you're in a phase of a cycle where you're more sort of active then you know you won't come into contact with so the descending part is often accompanied with doing the sort of inner work of feeling and integrating Yeah, it's not often fun, Um, (laughs) but there's always gold as well. I'm particularly curious about it because there's something around the default, the, the autopilot that collectively it feels like we're in, which is sort of, if you're looking at the cycle in terms of like the yin and the yang and the yang part of the cycle is the coming out and the creativity and the doing and the goal setting and the yin is more the descending, the feeling, the being receptive, the surrendering. But if we're so focused on the yang, which is what collectively we are, it ends up feeling like we're sort of skimming the surface a lot. And that's what I notice in myself. If I'm like scrolling or doing Netflix and I'm constantly occupied, I start feeling like I'm just skimming the surface and I'm not really accessing a layer of life that just feels like it's needed in order to just really feel feel myself and feel the depth of being a human that's alive in this day and age. There's like a sense of like denying, denying something. 
that dissent, I think, is really a medicine for these times of moving out of surface layer kind of avoidance. Yeah, I think it, it's what roots us down into our bodies and that real sense of belonging and why we're here. I just want to ask that last sentence that you said. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we have to go a little bit deeper into that, the sense of belonging and why we're here. How does that become clearer for you in the descent? If the yang is sort of up and out and the yin is down and in, so the yin is descending, that's like when I allow my presence, my awareness to sort of come inwards and feel my body. I know that for some people, transcending the body through meditation, through plant medicines can also be like a massively connecting, unifying experience. But I think perhaps we have access to both and a really important one and one that feels like more my path is really starting to feel myself as a body, not just a brain. I am body rather than I have a body. And that that is such a key to feeling a sense of like kinship with the material world. Because I think when we are in our heads when we identify with thoughts and head realm it can feel quite separate and isolating and then through that sort of coming down into the body it's like recognizing kinship what does that look and feel like well it's just so beautiful feeling how my womb cycles are a sort of microcosm of macro cycles happening around me and to feel that wow I'm just made of the same stuff as like the universe or there's like a sort of softening and the releasing of tension that comes from sort of connecting with the ground with nature and feeling that sense of connection I notice like when I come into presence in my body and sort of connect with nature that everything just like softens and the tension is released. And it's like, it's the tension somehow that connects that, that for me keeps me feeling separate and like I need to protect myself from the world. As I share this, I'm also aware that it's not all roses coming into the body, like developing more awareness of the body. And that's one thing that's been quite a big part of my journey over the last years of really developing a very intimate relationship with my womb. It makes sense that the more awareness you bring into your body, the more you become aware of how disconnected you've been from your body. And there's reasons for that as well, because the body can be a scary place to feel like when it comes to trauma and frozen emotions in the body. And so my womb has been a big key in helping me to access some of those places, which yeah can be by its very nature like overwhelming at times. Mm. So the belonging is the the recognition of, and as you said, being made of the same stuff of the universe. Yeah, so. yeah, like kinship made of the same stuff. Mm. That's how I feel it. And also made with the same universal laws as well. No, I really resonate with everything you're sharing and, and the, the path of embodiment being beautiful in all the ways. And with that, of course, embracing the challenge, because of course it's easier to live on the surface. Although a path of embodiment might connect us deeper to where our pain is and be that physical or emotional, it, it also does connect us deeper to where our pleasure is. And for that, it is worth it. <laughs> 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 but also that you can really connect to the power of processing and releasing. There's so much in the spiritual personal development world that's this sort of ideology of you get to a place where everything's great and you're healed and then 
it's not your pain, it's your mind and all of this kind of thing. And I've found none of that to be true. There's always a balance of like how how deep into the pain you want to go, is appropriate to go, is safe to go. You have the physical time, space, support, resources, all of that thing around you to go into because there's always more. And so we have to balance that with knowing when when we can be in a in a more joyful, easy, uh, that's cool, kind of playful space. That's definitely something that we can that we learned. We we understand ourselves and we learn to navigate. I have found that the only way that I have got through very tough situations in my own life is by being unafraid of of that pain and, and that release. And it enlightens in not the kind of the sense of it transcends, but it takes the load off. But you have to be prepared to go into that space where you will release it. And so for me, I recognize that that's a part of my menstrual cycle. And it's also a part of my cycles as a human, as a space holder, as a leader, that I will allow myself to go into those places and schedule them (laughs) in a way, because I will make sure that my schedule has enough space for me to go where I need to go in order to be ready for whatever the next season is. I guess in a way that can sound a little bit like it's about getting back to productivity, but I don't mean it in that way. I mean it more in in that I recognize the importance of of having that space that allows me to be who I am in the world. And that is part of who I am in the world. Yeah. And that I feel a, a beauty in that. Whereas one of the things I've had to work through is a shame around that. And that, you know, well, if you've done all of this work on yourself, whatever, how come you still feel this sometimes? Or how come this pain still comes up? Or how come you've you've got a virus? I mean, that's this is one of the things that's happening at this moment, that there's a lot of shaming of a virus during a pandemic that if you're spiritual enough, if you're healthy enough, you won't get the virus. And therefore, if you have, you failed. And you know, that this, this, there's a lot of this in the world. So much. And it's really dangerous because it's not that simple. It's a lot more complex than that. We can welcome in that complexity and we can, we can welcome in that very intricate unknown relationship between what it is that we are in quote unquote control of or that we can influence and we can shape with what we can't and where our part is in a more collective dynamic if I didn't have what I call cycles of death and rebirth regularly I wouldn't be able to be Mm -hmm. it's that simple it's just so good to speak about it like I love listening to you share about it I just wish that we could have more conversations around it because as you say like there's this sort of general cultural conditioning and it's very narrow ideas of what's strength and what's weakness and then there's the whole spiritual conditioning my goodness I've to a certain amount, like we we undergo this cultural programming and we're kind of helpless to it as we grow up. And then there's the things that we put ourselves through and the amount of spiritual conditioning <laughs> that I have like put myself through and then spent the last years trying to dissect. But yeah, I think the more we speak about it and, you know, we are culture creators. We are here creating a new culture that, I mean, it sounds cliche, doesn't it? But it's like that sees the power in vulnerability and that sees the intelligence in emotions, that sees symptoms of the body as being a really intelligent way that the body is speaking to us and inviting our awareness that we 
claim our tears, that we claim the wisdom of our rage, that we talk about the need to like, okay, I need to go carve out this time in my schedule and die a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I want to live in a world where like, you know, that's just part of what it is to be a human being. Okay, I'm just going to go to my personal underworld. (laughs) And also because when it comes to like descending, I feel like tribe matters. Yeah. Because it's one thing to descend on your own. And it's another thing when you know that there's people waiting for you when you get back. You know, there's a certain amount of like the hero's journey that you do on your own by its very nature. But then to have those like moments of connection and people who can support you and to give you a, a lifeline when you need it. To be welcomed back, yes. knowing that you've brought some treasure, you know, yes. that's that's of benefit to your entire community. And and often it's not like that. It's like you kind of have to explain yourself. <laughs> like, yeah. And it it just feels like there's there's a lack of understanding. There's a there's a sort of a sort of pity, perhaps, instead of like a good for you, like, you know, yes there's no other way like go deep like meet what's there meet the pain meet the grief meet the rage and and find what its teachings are I notice with myself when it comes to descending during my bleed no that's the part of our cycle when it's really about the descending it's really hard to go to very deep places when you're not sure who's going to be there when you get back and I think that's what motivates me so much in my work is to like create connections and relationships between people so that we can have this field of support and hold each other and welcome each other back yeah and to know that that you're going to be welcomed and whatever change or whatever transformation has happened is also going to be welcomed and because sometimes there's that thing where you might have people in your life that are really invested in you being where you were and so being on those journeys it blocks something. I was talking to one of the wise women in my life about something that's coming up for me this year. And she was, You're, you need to go on a journey before that can happen. And in between the lockdowns, I was exploring, like, what would that journey look like? And could I get care for my family so that I could step away? And where can I go? And then, of course, more lockdown. And it's like, okay, it's going to be like, um, this is going to be a journey in this room. (laughs) But yet it's going to be as deep and, you know, maybe not as pleasant as as going into temples and whatnot or traveling over land and seeing different things, but actually having to go on a very, very deep journey within like the physical space that, that one is in in order to allow the the parts that have been wanting to be composted, to be given back, to allow those new seeds to open. And I feel that that is, yeah, a beautiful gift. I was wondering if it would become normal that you could actually put on your email signature, descended into the underworld, (laughs) (laughs) reply dates currently unknown. (laughs) And with that, the sense that It doesn't mean that something's wrong and you're not coping. And I feel that 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 culture of fixing or shaming, it's so toxic, as is speed. And another email signature that I've seen recently that's made me happy is one that says, you know, I will not read your email within probably for a couple of days. And then I'm going to take another couple of days to just feel into what I might want to say back to your email. (laughs) And that's something that it would be really great if we could work a little bit with that immediacy and the pinging on so many different apps. It's such a beautiful example of taking the time to descend in our connections with people. No, the usual default autopilot of just like responding quickly and a little bit mindlessly compared to like perhaps being in connection maybe with less people, but then really taking the time, feeling in like before we respond, allowing that response to come from a deeper place, really being in connection with that person. It just, I don't know, I can feel quite a hunger to 
for that place in 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 us collectively in many of us i think because we've sort of lost that we're spreading ourselves so so thinly but yeah as you're speaking i'm also like dreaming a little bit of like what would the world be like if there was a culture of really valuing and encouraging descends into our personal underworlds and collective underworlds as well like what difference would that make to our lives I would love to dabble a little bit in there with you I'm just curious what what comes up for you well interestingly the first thing that comes up is very practical it's like how would you maintain the vital systems And so with that, you know, I feel like this pandemic is a really good example of where there's a really big invitation into a collective descent. And yet the reality of that, which is happening in in certain ways and and not others, is that people then don't have money and parents are struggling trying to do homeschooling whilst working jobs and all in the same in the same room and so how would we actually create a system that could handle that and how would we do it not knowing when everyone would need their descents obviously on a on a more consciousness level like I'm like yes this would be amazing we need it I would love some of our politicians to go on some personal descent journeys <laughs> and get to reflect a little bit on <laughs> what it is they're doing, what their motivations are, how does their body feel about, about what's been happening. And with that, I've had a curiosity recently as both Donald Trump and Boris Johnson had COVID and were in hospital, like hospitalized with COVID, and then were back at work within days, absolutely fine. I've just had something. I had no COVID symptoms. It took me, after the few days of having to be in bed, it took me like another week before I had normal-ish energy again. And so it's just a curiosity that I have. (laughs) Like what enables that to be possible? And especially when we're talking about men of a certain age that aren't necessarily images of health and well-being. And so then how is that possible? I don't know if you know the answer to that, but that's a question that that's that I'm curious about. But I'm sure, Amisha, if you like really connected with your will and your will was like, I am going to get up in two days and I'm going to do this massively important thing. And then you had a bunch of doctors feeding you steroids and various medications to help you like feel, you know, some semblance of like returning to normality. You know, it would have been a different experience for you as well. Uh, Yeah. Okay. I could have harangued myself, but I was in my descent. (laughs) You could have harangued yourself. And yet when we refuse to surrender, then we're refusing the teachings as well. So we know what changed with Boris Johnson and Trump when they got COVID. It seemed like Boris was a little bit touched with the care he received from the nurses. But other than that, I don't know. Yeah. And Trump felt more invincible. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it's whatever lessons you might want to garner from an experience. As we're talking about, like, what would a a culture be like where the descent was valued? I mean, that's something that has to be first taught because it is scary to go into that place. That we need community. We need emotional support level, but also on a very practical support level. You know, while you have less, I can give a little bit more. And then on a very practical organizational institutional level with uh, people being supported financially we need more awareness and focus there on care and well-being rather than an investing in that and you know it's funny I was having this thought the other day there are traditional masculine and traditional feminine areas that governments can invest in and you know you don't ever really hear about a government not having enough money to invest in like weapons and more traditionally masculine sort of areas but then you know, we often hear about when it comes to the traditionally feminine of child care and support, family support, and all of these things. 
that there's not enough money. So it would, it would need a complete reshuffling of what we value and channel money into. And especially as those more, more feminine areas of our society are areas that if as an individual you have resources, you can create for yourself. I feel that that also plays into it, that if our health systems or education systems are, are falling apart, those that have resources will be able to create another reality for themselves. Whereas when it comes to something like weapons or national defense, then that affects everybody and it's different in that way. I just remembered that I did do a week of big talks, including a TEDx talk whilst I had glandular fever. It was undiagnosed, but <laughs> it was pretty intense and I was not well. And so, yes, it is true. One can harangue oneself. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I couldn't now, though. That's my favorite thing about getting older is how intolerant my body has become. It's like, uh, for me, it's wonderful. It's like I can't bypass things in the way that I used to. I need to be humble and respect my body's limitations. But I, yeah, I enjoy that. Maybe enjoy is not the right word, but I really I receive the benefits there of that. It's a balance, isn't it? Because I also feel that when I'm in service, that might mean caring for an elderly relative or you know young ones, or even if you and your partner are both sick and you're a bit less sick, like they're throwing up and and you're not like you can make things happen yeah I feel like that's an, an interesting area of balance too of how community motivates us and gives us more energy it can tip over to the point where we're over giving but there there is a sweet spot where it actually opens up more resource within us yeah that's a really juicy area <laughs> that I think touches so many of us. You know, I've had so many realizations of seeing how I suffer from martyr syndrome of putting others before me. <laughs> and then there's a feeling of rightness to explore life when you're really looking at yourself first so you can give from an overflowing cup. But then there are ways in which you give and you receive so much nourishment in return. It's complex, hey? <laughs> ways in which you give in a very natural aligned way ways in which you give because of ingrained patterns yeah I talk about being a martyr in recovery oh <laughs> uh, yeah oh you one too oh yeah. nice to meet you <laughs> well I feel that most of our friends listening to this show will be as well yeah because those that are naturally drawn towards wondering how we can do things in a different way wanting to create systems of deeper care and community and respect of nature and all of these things have had to face that journey within themselves of beautiful intentions that are very real and I believe very dharmic that are very you know in our souls like often when you talk to people within that kind of category of, of experiences it's always there from like the childhood stuff like one friend literally dreamt about climate change 40 years ago as a child it would have wake up like with kind of cold sweats and actually never told her parents what it was because it was so like big and you know others are like yeah I was always really into like making sure that all the litter was always picked up as a child or or whatever because I felt the pain of the earth that stuff is there and often it's really there for people and then there's that journey of of the overgiving and the playing out of patterns from the family of origin system and all of that again it's like it's that finding that place of balance between the reciprocity and being in that relationship and then when it goes into one shadow material and what I find so interesting about everything actually that we're talking about in this conversation is that those lines are in very different places for everyone 
and at every different time as well. From the outside, what might seem to be overgiving or overworking or over pushing might not be. There might be another scenario where from the outside, it looks the opposite to how it really is. And this is why I feel like intuition is the most needed skill in all of this, because that's what helps us to know for ourselves where we are. Yeah, and what and what is okay for us and and how we can find our place of balance or how we can find even where where that action in that area of our life balances out with a different action in another part of our lives. It's just so personal. It's so hard to measure up. For me, it's intuition that allows us to find that that relationship and that sense of yeah. And I love how like we all have our own like key or puzzle piece or doorway with which we sort of view. And so yours is intuition and mine, which is related, but is is cycles. So for me, it's so supportive to know like on a you know larger cycle, am I in a place in my life where it is about showing up in this way and sort of action orientated or am I in a part of a cycle where it's really about allowing myself to be more restored or is it about taking a step out and like looking at where I am or is it about planting seeds for the future and so our keys fit nicely together as well somehow yeah well to me they're the same key Mm. because how do you know where you are in your cycle without your intuition yeah yeah how have you cultivated that relationship of of intuition of knowing yourself of feeling yeah fe- of feeling good about the choices that you make and the part of your cycle that you understand yourself to be in and i guess the caveat of that is knowing that there is always the fool and the tricking of ourselves and all of these like other playful aspects and yet also knowing that we also can have a sense of feeling yeah this is where I am (laughs) in my cycle right now and this is what I need maybe just share a tiny puzzle piece of like what kicked off my journey was that I suffered from chronic pain as a young adult became aware quite quickly that like no doctor was going to be able to help me because it was just ridiculous what they would do no doctor put me on benzodiazepines when I was 18 without telling me what they were (laughs) uh kick-starting my first addiction venture into (laughs) sensitivities but it was a very um powerful initiation into the knowing that I needed to listen within I've had many moments that have supported me to trust the little signs that my body is giving me. And it's been quite a process because I feel like that as much love as I received from my parents, they weren't good at supporting me to really feel myself and trust myself. And that was mirrored also in the way that I was educated in school and, um, you know, just the general culture that has us look to outside authority figures and not really trust the inner impulses. I think I've had enough experiences of the word that came to me as you were speaking is is trust that I've really looked at my relationship to trusting my body. The menstrual cycle work has been so useful because it's like a map. It's like, okay, I know what the archetypal cycle is within me. And now I can kind of compare my everyday experience with the archetypal cycle you know, the archetypal cycle being that you have one framing, one map is that you have your four inner seasons of winter being menstruation, summer ovulation, and then spring and autumn. And so it's really helped me cultivate sensitivity because at first it just seemed absurd to be able to discern what is coming from within me and what I'm just experiencing as a reaction to the being bombarded with stimulation from the outside world and so to have that map and to really over a long time now over years work on becoming more and more sensitive and then learning to trust more and more so that's really helped me yeah so like when when my body feels i'm doing something and or I'm in contact with someone and I notice that there's a little 
sort of subtle, subtle shutting down or discomfort, I don't ignore that. Um, you know, what is that? What is that trying to tell me? Or if there's a sense of aliveness or like, uh, you know, you know, my cells start tingling. It's like, oh, okay, there's something here for me to discover. <laughs> yeah. So trusting those little signs and developing the sensitivity to actually feel them. Hello. We're taking a short pause from the conversation. On behalf of our team and our community, thank you for being here and co-creating The Future is Beautiful. Much dedication, love and time goes into the production of this show. We believe in being advertising free in a world that's always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. And so we make this show with you and for you, thanks to your support. There are three ways you can be more involved so we can share the vision, wisdom and creativity here as we explore what it means to be a human in this time. You can support the podcast by sharing it with your friends, posting episodes on social media and doing iTunes reviews. You can support as a patron by making a monthly or one-off donation of your choice. And with this, you join the global patrons group and monthly video calls where we share connection and insight. You get to know the other amazing patrons from around the world, their stories and their work, and you offer direct support to me and the team, as well as being brought into the behind the scenes of creating something like this. It sounds like a lot, but it's as much or as little as you want to get involved in. You can become a member of Presence, our membership collective of care and practice, where we explore how to embody the themes of the podcast with workshops, calls, special events, tree whispers, and powerful tools, practices, and rituals that you can bring into your life. This is open to absolutely everybody as we create an inclusive and diverse space that celebrates well-being as a human right, where we explore together what it means to be creative, courageous, and connected to ourselves, each other, and the earth. This is about embodying sacred activism. We love meeting patrons and presence members and how being part in this way weaves our lives together as well as making this show possible. If anything from this conversation has moved or inspired you, please get more involved. All information can be found at www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community. This show really can't go on without your patronage and presence membership, so please do make it happen. And now, back to the conversation. You posted something this morning. <laughs> so it was on my, on my radar as I was tuning into this conversation. Yeah, you posted an article in The Guardian around why more and more women are choosing to be single as an active choice. I feel like this is a really interesting conversation for so many where there is this still, still, there's like a, a kind of a spinster archetype in the mix <laughs> um, or a sense that your life isn't anything until you have a partner and children. In a way, that's a cycle that must be part of the, the female-bodied experience. Yeah, something is happening. I mean, I know so many fantastic women that are not in relationships or not with children for a multitude of reasons from somebody that I was talking to yesterday that said she really didn't feel to bring children into this world with the climate situation to women that have found themselves in relationship after relationship with men that feel not ready to have a child. They then go into the next relationship and then the man reveals they're not ready again and so have found themselves in that cycle to women that have had lots of fertility issues and not been able to have children that way to women that just haven't felt a connection or that it's or even it just hasn't really come up it's not even that they sat down and made a big decision about it we are living in this this world where that is shifting and you know I watched Alice in Wonderland yesterday with my nieces <laughs> and 
at the beginning of the film there's this engagement and it's like you don't want to end up like Aunt Nora <laughs> and, and Aunt Nora Aww. was of course she's the old spinster yeah and of course she was bumbly she, you know she wasn't able to express her sentences very clearly she was fantastical waiting for a young prince that you know the, the whole thing was just there was no respect of the journey that Aunt Nora may have been on. And so here we are in this space again of shame. Yeah, and this, a sense that, that if a life looks different to a 2.4 children kind of lifestyle in 2021, that there's something wrong. And you have shared around different aspects of this in, in lots of different ways over the years that I've known you. And I always feel very moved by those shares. And I always witness that a lot of other people feel very moved by those shares. Because I also know of, of women that, that have that from the outside, the partner and the children, and feel completely trapped and depressed and and not not themselves within it there's such a spectrum here around the expectation and the reality yeah I don't know what my question is I I I actually don't want to ask a really clear question and the reason being because I don't want to like probe in to like a specific aspect of this so my question is, what do you want to share around this <laughs> ginormous and very mm. complex and personal and not personal? Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't even want to say issue because somehow issues connotated with something bad, but mm. around, yeah, this it's a phenomena. This phenomena. Yeah. <laughs> Because it is happening more and more. I mean, that's what this article was was saying. And I, I don't know if the uh, the title may have been misleading. The title was something around why more and more women are choosing it. For me, the essence of the article was to, it was a beautiful personal sharing of the ambivalence and the complexity of being a, yeah, a lot of people use the word child free rather than childless or and without partner. And so, yeah, I've been quite open sharing my complexity around that, that there's, you know, that the mothers that I know, it's like, wow, there is such sacrifice that goes into bringing up children. And of course, so much beauty and reward as well. And yet I, it, it excites me what's happening, that there are more and more women who are finding themselves in a position where they don't have children and are experiencing life more sovereign without being married. Because I think of our history and I think of all the ways in which we have had to serve husband, family, and the journey that we've been on. And it feels like a sort of blossoming and it's disorientating because there is no, and this was my point that I came to after reading this article, is that we don't have an archetype really around, you know, we, we're very familiar with the archetype of the mother. And we're kind of familiar with the archetype of the spinster who everyone feels a bit sorry for. And, you know, but we need to create a new archetype for um, the woman who is choosing a different path for herself or perhaps not choosing, but life is somehow because I think if I had made the choice, I would have chose family and partnership. And yet I feel like, especially if you look at the lens of, and this is what I find really fascinating. And I think I shared this because we talked about this a little bit, didn't we, on um, your beautiful summit, that what if there's an intelligence to what's happening and that it's part of the earth's intelligence that there's more and more of us who are somehow feeling called to serve our creativity in the earth in other ways, not just through having children. And that's a very sensitive subject because I don't want to transmit the sense that you can't be in, you know, that you're not in service by having children. Of course you are, or that you can't be in service in other ways and have children, which of course you can be as well. But there's something that I feel in myself that I, 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 
it feels like it wants naming and it feels like it wants honoring and it feels like it wants a, a dignity to be restored. I also don't have like lots of, you know, bullet points and things to share on this topic. I just want to have the conversation. I want to, I want to feel my sisters around me who are also feeling the sort of relief of having so much time to invest in things that, you know, we want to choose for ourselves and the freedom. And yet also, you know, how do we manage that fear of missing out and knowing that we are missing out on a, you know, really deeply archetypal initiatory experience of being women? It's big. Yeah, it's big. And I, I just want to take a breath for the women and, and men that find themselves, especially in this pandemic, in a situation that is not the one that is 100% aligned with what they choose for themselves and that are in a process of, of navigating the grief and the opportunities within that position I mean and, and likewise many relationships have ended during this pandemic and there have been many divorces and breaking ups and the, the pressure cooker of being at home in a scenario that was just about okay when everyone was out and about and busy you know that that that's also something that many people are experiencing during this time. Yeah, it's funny. It's somehow never been harder in a way to have a relationship, that even though there's an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just it just bubbled up this this sense that, you know, when we lived more hierarchically you know, there were less relationship problems because there's less freedom and less possibility to like have arguments. And, you know, as a woman, you'd kind of lived under the authority of the man or like all relationships, you know, there was just more hierarchy. And now that there's more connection, it brings up more of our stuff. And even though there's more tools and resources and comforts and ways of enjoying life, it's like never been harder somehow to like actually maintain a functional relationship. Yeah, I definitely want to signpost for any women that want to go deeper into this, that we did have a really beautiful conversation around it in Style and Presence and with three of us so coming from three different perspectives where we shared a lot. And so that's definitely a really great resource if this is something that is resonating. What does it look like to really restore or create a new archetype with dignity how do we do that I mean in a way we're doing it by having this conversation by rejecting <laughs> the, the spinster and acknowledging that there's something missing what a brilliant question and inquiry. I don't have lots of amazing answers, but if I look into my own life, how I feel like I'm working on it, it's by having conversations and bringing it out of the darkness, you no, know, because there is sort of there is shame. But also I notice that when I connect with other women who are in a similar position to me and we celebrate together, like we do celebratory things. That just feels like really affirming and really strengthening the sense of beauty and strength and dignity and elegance and joy. And yeah, I think sisterhood is a really important aspect of it. And of course, you know, there's sisterhood that includes all women. And then there's perhaps a sisterhood that can be valuable when it's connecting with people who are in a similar situation to you, that there's something very powerful about being witnessed and seen and then coming into this celebration of one another. Do you have any sense of what this archetype looks like or how it can be strengthened? Yeah, I, I resonate with what you've shared. I, I mean, that sense of ritual and celebration 
the honoring of what's possible because of being in this situation and the honoring of like what's important about it so that that is actually like valued and enjoyed because when there's a a situation that is outside of what what is deemed the cultural norm or ideal if you're living your life in that way and this could be for any reason whatsoever even like you've you've chosen a, a different kind of career path or something like that but there's something about motherhood and partners that you know it's the first thing that even a child will ask you <laughs> are you married do you have any children you know it's so ingrained and it's something that's so personal and yet it's so in your face like constantly and it's something that you know is often seen as as a problem or an issue and especially when it comes to like extended family or kind of older generations and and so i feel like it's something that anyone that is in a situation where they don't have a partner or they don't have children or they don't have both at the same time <laughs> that they are facing a lot of judgment and a lot of maybe pity or sense that there's something wrong and so I feel like anything that creates on a community level in relationship with other human beings, an acknowledgement of what's beautiful and what is happening because of being in that situation, which we can honor and celebrate that that is needed for everyone. And that of course, the more that we do that, the more that that becomes something, you know, that, that could even be a role model and that, is, that could even be something to aspire to. And we do have some characters, you know, in our myths and that are, are women that are not mothers or that are not consorts, <laughs> but still they are in, in a lot of the, the stories in, in many, many cultures. And so having, and because we don't get that even from, you know, our media around women that have chosen it in a very powerful way, and yet they still get the, the witch shaming and the, the sense of being, you know, the failure. I mean, Jennifer Aniston is like the the archetypal celebrity of that experience that there's been this poor Jennifer, poor Jennifer, like, you know, yet another failed relationship, <laughs> still no children. <laughs> like, and I feel like she, she is one of those archetypes, but no one ever lets her talk about what's yeah. been positive for her in that experience you should interview jennifer aniston <laughs> <laughs> if she wants to come and talk about what she's achieved what has been that personal evolution in fact how she has managed to maintain a smile on her face with that level of shaming you know yeah, i'd love to have that conversation because we need to know and and not from a place of defense and then there was emma watson as well do you remember when someone asked her about her relationship status and she said she was self-partnered. <laughs> yeah, and then she got lots of backlash for it. But, you know, good on her that we're starting to develop a new language for it as well. But I, what I would love to see is, um, and I think I can, I sense and I know that it is starting to happen, that we have more rituals like mothers. You know, it's becoming more common or it's being restored that we have rituals to welcome new mothers and integrate ritual in a larger sense more into our lives we're realizing how we need that but also what would it look like to um, have a ritual to sort of honor the path of being a woman who does not have children in this world yeah that's exciting the last thing that I would like for us to share a little bit about in this conversation is for our brothers that are listening because a lot of this conversation has been leaning towards menstrual cycles or experience of being in, in a female body and we have lots of beautiful men folk here what is it that you want to share with them around the importance of cycles 
Mm. Well, if you've made it this far into the podcast, <laughs> then I love you. <laughs> Because it just, you know, often what I see happening is that when something has the word menstrual cycle in it, or it's like has a more female presence, then a lot of men will automatically decide, oh, that's not for me. And yet, you know, hello, like we all know someone with a menstrual cycle or everyone, regardless of gender, I think would benefit from just developing their awareness so that we can understand each other more. And so I think curiosity about the menstrual cycle for men is so wonderful and needed and I think it can be so supportive of nurturing good relationships with women I'm just uh would love to transmit the sense that uh, I think I mentioned this before that the menstrual cycle is just one example of many different cycles and it's somehow how I sense it is it's part of our birthright it's part of the sort of universal law if you like there's a cyclical blueprint we are all on a quest of coming into right relationship with ourselves and with life we're all on a quest I imagine of trying to find out what balance feels like within ourselves we're all on a quest of like stepping out of burnout culture I imagine many people can identify with these inquiries and that paying attention to cycles whether that's sort of seasonal cycles moon cycles or these sort of larger life cycles no we all know what it's like to have a phase in our life where we know that it's about like coming out into the world and like doing our thing and we all know what it's like when it just feels like no nah, that's not what's happening it's more about coming back to myself and reassessing or actually you know i need to really let go of something and let my identity just kind of dissolve what I know it as and go through this rebirth as you said Amisha I'm hoping that there have been I'm trusting that there have been pockets of inspiration for people listening regardless of of gender and a big thank you for you know to those who don't have wombs or who are listening because it feels like when it comes to the wisdom of the womb cycle that there's such a medicine in it for these times and to have curiosity as to what the because for me the menstrual cycle also really enables access into the realms of the sort of archetypal feminine and that is a medicine and a wisdom for these times that I'm so grateful for when there's a curiosity and an openness towards that and that feminine lives within all of us of course Thank you. How can our friends listening connect to you deeper and what offerings or ways of dancing and playing together do you have? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, my main website that I use is knowyourflow.com with little hyphens or dashes between each word. And I'm actually beginning a new round of Know Your Flow, which is, as well as the name of the website, it's the name of an online course that I offer into menstrual cycle awareness over 13 weeks. So it's a really nice chunk of time to really get into the practice. And there's this amazing, Amisha, amazing community that's sort of built up around that, where we stay in touch and uh, connect and have monthly learning sessions where we invite other people to come in and explore with us and so that feels really juicy and thriving and necessary in these times of um, going against the grain in this way by being so sensitive to the wisdom of our bodies so that's starting on the 25th and I like to write a sort of sporadic love letter um, I'm ever sort of feeling into what feels in integrity in the ways that I communicate with the world and being very mindful in not wanting to fall into old ways of marketing and I love to write and have little thought bombs that I like to share with people so I describe it as my sporadic love letter when the muse strikes so everyone is welcome to sign up for that as well and where do they find that on the same website and you can also find me on facebook or instagram um, know your flow on instagram ruby luna may on facebook thank you ruby this has been a, a soft gentle first conversation of this year a welcoming back from my descent mm. so thank you for embodying that within this thank you thank you for spending your precious time with us 
As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible with you, our community. If you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on Community and Support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?